And um, mm -hmm. am I correct in saying that you're 85 years of age? Yes, that's true. The or to be more precise. I shall be if I live for another few weeks. And since your retirement from the Medical Research Council, you found other interests as chairman of the Wellcome Trust. Yes, that is so. But your mention of that now reminds me that it is more than 55 years since in 1904, as then still a youngish physiologist, I began to get my first experience of research in pharmacology in the Wellcome Laboratories where I remained for the next 10 years. And that led directly to my major research opportunity in my service with the Medical Research Council for the next 28 years. But my researches in that main period, about some of which I expect you're going to ask me questions, was largely derived from clues which I'd picked up in those earlier 10 years. And now in your retirement? Well, as you've already said, I'm finding new kind of opportunity in bringing help to the researches of other people as chairman of the trustees appointed by the will of the late Sir Henry Welcome. These trustees draw their income, you know, from the pharmaceutical business which belonged to Henry Welcome himself while he lived. And they use that income for the support of research and uh, historical scholarship in the general field of medicine anywhere in the world. And in 1936, I think, Sir Henry, you were awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine jointly with Otto Lerde. Yes, that was, sir. And may I say that it uh, gave me an additional pleasure in that the award was made jointly with my old friend, Professor Lerde, whom I've known for, I suppose, about 60 years, since he worked in London for the first time and in Cambridge near the beginning of this century. And that award was given for the uh, work that you did on the chemical transmission of the effects on nerve impulses. That's it. That's true, yes. But we ought to remember, you know, that 32 years earlier, in 1904, the idea of such a chemical transmission of the effects of nerve impulses was actually proposed by another friend of mine, Professor T.R. Elliot, while he was still working as a research student in Cambridge. He put it forward to explain what he was then working on, the remarkable correspondence between the effects of injecting adrenaline and those of stimulating the nerves of the true sympathetic system. And it wasn't till 10 years later, in 1914, that I came across acetylcholine in a peculiar herb extract and was helped in identifying it by remembering that Professor Reed Hunt of Harvard, some years earlier, had had that substance made for him artificially and had found that it had an extremely potent inhibitory effect on the action of the heart. It was, that, I, it was that the only effect then? Of no, no, when I came to examine the uh, effects of acetylcholine on the internal organs in general, first I found that these corresponded in a most remarkable and significant manner with the effects of stimulating their nerve supplies through the parasympathetic nerve system. And beyond, just as Elliot had found, that uh, the effects of adrenaline corresponded with those of stimulating the true sympathetic nerve supplies. But beyond all that, I found also, what was perhaps even more significant, that acetylcholine also stimulated all the cells in autonomic ganglia and the motor end plates of voluntary muscle fibers and then to jump some 20 years ahead later with a series of distinguished co-workers we succeeded in demonstrating that acetylcholine was actually liberated at these synaptic junctions in ganglia and at the endings of voluntary motor nerves to transmit the effects of the impulse to the motor end plate of muscle fiber. And where does Otto Lerde come in? Um, earlier, because Elliot's work with adrenaline in 1904, my own with acetylcholine in 1914, 
had, as it were, I think, prepared the way for what was to come in 1921, when Otto Loewy gave the first and beautifully simple demonstration of such a transmission of nervous effects by liberation of chemical stimulators, when he stimulated the two nerve supplies to the isolated heart of a frog. And what then was the practical consequence of this work? Well, I'm always a bit shy, quite frankly, of seeming to claim practical con consequences in medicine for findings with which I've been concerned in the laboratory. But since you put the question, I think it is a fact that this discovery of this chemical mechanism for the transmission of effects at nerve junctions has had at least some effect on clinical conceptions of nerve functions in general and, of course, of the disorders of those functions. And that, in particular, the application in treatment of now a whole long list of drugs, some of them natural, some of them artificial, most of them artificial, which either antagonize or directly accentuate the effect of one or another of these uh, transmitters when they are liberated, or, on the other hand, hinder the actual liberation of one or the other of them. And while it was engaged in this series, which I think you call the sympathomimetic amines, yeah. uh, that you uh, devoted your attention to noradrenaline. Yes, remember, 50 years ago, that time, noradrenaline was still a new synthetic curiosity. It had been made by one of the big German firms and it had been made independently in this country by a man who was then a young research chemist who was to become another of my closest friends, Henry Dakin. What I found about noradrenaline was that it not only, as perhaps was to be expected, reproduced effects of sympathetic nerve stimulation as adrenaline itself did, but that it did so with a much closer accuracy of detail than adrenaline did. And what did that lead to? Well, after many years, to the recent discoveries that noradrenaline, after all, is not merely a synthetic curiosity, but is an actual constituent of the living body, and particularly of the sympathetic nervous system, and that in many species, including our own human species, it does act as the principal transmitter of the effects of sympathetic nerve impulses. Those discoveries uh, have been made largely by men who at one time or another have worked in my own laboratory, but they've made them long after I myself retired, now 18 years ago. And what about the old liquid extract of Ergot, mm. in whose uh, value the general practitioners had great belief? although I think that belief was challenged by the pharmacologists and indeed by yourself. Yes. Well, of course, that's another story and one in which I had the privilege of being an interested spectator and perhaps to some extent a consultant rather than an active participant. What happened was that the Medical Research Council had been asked to get an accurate clinical comparison between two well-known alkaloids of ergot for which rival claims were being made to be the essential obstetric constituent. And they'd invited Dr. Chassa Boyer, who was then a keen young obstetrical registrar, to undertake the comparison. And he'd consulted with me, and uh, I perhaps helped him to obtain a suitable apparatus, which he used to obtain objective records of the contractions of the puerperal human uterus. And with that, he very soon settled the matter because he found no difference whatever between the actions on the human uterus of these two well-known alkaloids. But he also found that neither of them had any distinct activity of that kind when it was given by the mouth. Yeah, but where does the old liquid extract of ergot come in? Oh, in both ways because that was always given by the mouth, and also it contained no recognizable traces of either of those alkaloids. So that if the general practitioners and the obstetricians who used it uh, had any good ground for their belief in its activity, 
It must be due to something else. Well, now, Chasamaya had at his disposal an ideal technique for putting that to the test. And he very soon got the result, which was to show that the old liquid extract had administered in the conventional way by the mouth had a very potent and very valuable action on the activity of the human uterus. And then uh, the way was clear for him to cooperate with my late chemical colleague, Dr. Harold Dudley, and they were at work for nearly three years until finally, from the old liquid extract, Dudley succeeded in isolating an hitherto unknown alkaloid, now known as ergometrin and recognized everywhere, I think, as the essential obstetrically valuable constituent of ergot which I, among others, had been looking for in vain for many years by laboratory methods. Well, then, am I correct in supposing that your work on ergot indeed led to many important further discoveries? Yes, a number of discoveries of quite different kind. For example, in some of my early experiments with ergot, I came across quite by accident evidence for the presence in the pituitary posterior lobe of a very potent oxytocic hormone, now known as oxytocin. And then histamine came to my notice through its occurrence in a peculiar extract of ergot. And Barger and I soon found that it was a natural constituent of the tissues of the body. And then when we came to examine its activities in detail, these showed a most remarkable correspondence to the chief features in different animal species of the then recently discovered and described anaphylactic reaction. Mm. And now, in recent years, the generation after mine has been discovering that histamine is actually released in the anaphylactic reaction. And all this evidence, of course, is naturally leading to an increasing application in therapeutics of substances which directly antagonize the actions of histamine. Uh, and this work led to your interest in, and indeed influence on the biological standardization uh, such as insulin? Well, I suppose I did have some influence on that, but chiefly, I think, by my insistence on the use of permanent, stable, standard substances, in terms of which generally accepted units had to be defined principle indeed which was already laid down as long ago as 1897 by the great Paul Ehrlich in his classical description of the standardization of the diphtheria antitoxin. You were indeed a pupil of for a short time. For a short time. Yes. What strikes one so forcibly Sir Henry is that your work has led to such important uh, clinical results both for the benefit of the doctor and the patient. Oh well if that it has happened insofar as it's happened. Uh, of course, it's been a stimulus and an encouragement to a laboratory worker. But I think I ought to say that except in response to some official prompting, I don't think I've ever worked with a consciously clinical aim. It's just happened that results which have fortunately been obtained in my laboratory on one thing or another have been recognized by other people as having useful clinical applications either for practice or theory. And altogether, you know, I, uh, I have the feeling that in more than one way, I've had more than my share of the good luck.